Welcome back to Akon 2. Next up on our speaker list is founder of Liberty.me, Jeffrey Tucker. Jeffrey is a foremost figure in advocating liberty, capitalism, and the philosophical and innovative ideas that continue pushing the envelope of social progress. The modest, bow-tied, bitcoining, bourbon-for-breakfast behemoth of the liberty movement continues to inspire generations that knew nothing of a world outside state influence. He is a self-described anarchist that goes by the motto, Anarchy because anything else would be uncivilized. Please welcome Jeffrey Tucker. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I really appreciate it. It was very lovely and it made me laugh, so <laughs> I appreciate that very much. I'm glad to be here and thank you so much for inviting me. I thought I would use what limited time I have today to kind of uh, describe to you something I don't think I've ever really entirely uh, told anybody about before, but uh, uh, since the the theme of our event today is about, about messaging and why it matters, um, I thought I would tell you a little bit of the story of the background for Liberty.me. I mean, after all, this is now one of the most important websites, uh, real pieces of web digital real estate in the Liberty world has had an enormous amount of influence. Its uh, traffic is, is very high. Uh, we publish now something on the order of two, three thousand articles, uh, cited all over the national news. It's been a big deal. But two years ago, this thing didn't even exist. So I've, if, 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 if this would be interesting to you, I thought I would kind of explain to you a little bit of the process that went into the creation of this space and why I you know, for me, it's, 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 uh, it was so, such an important thing and why it points to and how it points to a way in which we can all change our world through our own individual action. So, um, by way of background, uh, this is now uh, May of 2015. In May of 2013, I was seized with an idea. And when I say seized, it was a little bit like, like teen love. You know, it just overcame me. Uh, I, I imagined that it could happen. Uh, I wanted to make it happen. I could not get it out of my mind. I was sleeping less. I was eating less. Um, all I wanted to do was, was talk about the subject. And the subject was the possibility of creating a piece of digital real estate that allowed people to have unfiltered access to quality writings of a radical political sort that are not permitted in the mainstream media. I did not want to be the editor of the site. I wanted to create a beautiful toolbox that allowed other people in a spontaneous way to be able to enter into the space and write what they wanted to without having to obey any gatekeepers. In other words, I wanted to create a system of, of total freedom, a space of total freedom on the internet, essentially. And as a part of this, probably the publishing aspect was really important, but I also wanted it to become an important social vehicle too. And a distributor of important books and ideas and create an atmosphere of community that would crowdsource ideas for making the world a better place. Um, I hadn't seen anything else like that. One of the things that had really troubled me is that there have been so many good intellectuals and good thinkers out there who would start their own blogs and write some really good quality material but wouldn't have any way to get it out there into the mainstream. You know, they would send it to their friends, maybe link it on their Facebook account, put it on their Twitter account, whatever. But it it would never really amount to anything, and they would get tired and exhausted, and after six months they would give up because they figured that nobody was paying attention to them. And to me that's very depressing because my whole experience in the intellectual space, you know, and I've, I've been in the academic world, uh, I've been in the popular press world, my whole experience in, in everything I've done in my career is that you never know where the next great idea is going to come from. Typically, it doesn't come from government, and, and it doesn't come, surprisingly, from the halls of academia. Uh, good ideas come from, from strange places in strange ways you never really know. 
So I wanted some way to make sure that we didn't lose track of really great ideas, that really great ideas would have a chance to break through the wall of the mainstream media and actually uh, reach an audience that was substantial. So my idea was that we could create a, a, a space that would crowdsource our SEO. SEO means search engine optimization, um, meaning that, uh, that if, like none of us individually maybe could get an audience, but all of us together could gain enough attention so that all of our individual ideas then would have a chance to, to break through. So anyway, I was thinking through this uh, system and this idea, uh, a business, essentially. I did not want it to be a nonprofit because my whole experience with nonprofits is that they, they're not creative, they're not innovative, they tend to be risk averse and not um, embrace, you know, they're, they're so fearful of, of chaos and spontaneity and freedom that you know, they become over, overly controlling. Nonprofits are like little tiny socialist enterprises, as far as I can tell. I mean, I work for a nonprofit, so I, you know, I speak with some knowledge here. But I really wanted it to be a for-profit uh, venture so that we wouldn't have those kind of limitations. Anyway, this was all a vision, right? This was just nothing like this existed. It's just something I had in my mind. I'd never started a business before, just on my own. I'd never imagined into being something that had not previously existed, you know? Um, something that could, you know, really alter the landscape. But I couldn't get it out of my head. I mean, I was just obsessed with it. And I ruined countless numbers of lunches with, with, with friends uh, by taking over the conversation and doing nothing but talking about the prospect of this idea. And it's interesting because nothing like this had ever happened to me before. Well, that was two years ago, and now the darn thing exists. And uh, it's hard work. It's, it's uh, consumed vast amounts of my time and energy, uh, ca countless hours, uh, mostly unpaid. Um, but I'm very proud to say that it, it, it does exist. So uh, what happened between then and now uh, is, is a very interesting thing. Uh, throughout the summer of 2013, I began to work on a kind of a business plan. I had never written a business plan before. I didn't even know what a business plan looked like, so I just downloaded some from the internet and began to kind of improvise until I came up with a document that was 25 or 30 pages and specked out things like, you know, the amount of cost that would go into building a website, the amount of uh, labor time, you know, what I would have to pay contractors, uh, expectations for revenue generation, over a period of time, most of which is speculation, because you don't know. That's the the weird thing about the future is that it's it turns out to be uncertain. Uh, it's the single most frustrating aspect of doing business. Um, but I came up with a business plan. And I began to shop it around to investors, um, and I found how did I find these investors? You know, uh, we always imagine that there's maybe there's some 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 group of extremely wealthy people sitting around in a living room waiting for for young punks to come along with the next Facebook, you know, where they're going to they're gonna throw a bunch of money at it. That turns out that's not the way it works. What I did is I just tapped my network. Um, anybody I knew that seemed to have a lot of business experience and a lot of, um, uh, you know, influence and connections, I just began to write them and shop this plan around. Um, I, I specifically asked about 20 different people um, to become my investors. I knew that I needed something on the level of a half million dollars to make this thing even begin to be valuable. And that's what I was looking for. Um, and I got, I got, you know, one answer after another of no, 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 no. Um, it just, you know, people didn't believe it could work. They didn't think that I had a customer market for it, that I hadn't really worked it out well enough. There are a million reasons why there are people involved in other things. Um, you know, and, and when you're shopping for investor money, it's actually a little bit tricky because, you know, anytime you're asking somebody to dump a half million dollars into your business, you always have to remember that the opportunity cost of that half million dollars is actually very high. Um, you know, you could earn 5, 10, 15 percent just by parking your money in, in some, uh, some hedge fund somewhere, you know. So it's, it's not just 
it's not just the opportunity cost of the money where they're losing 15% a year possibly on that amount of money. They also stand a chance of losing the entire half million dollars. So this is a very difficult uh, thing to sell. But I finally did bump into some people who believed in what I was doing. And what was fascinating to me on that first breakfast we had together, um, I was prepared to present my business plan. And my investors, uh, I, I gave it to them. They put it down on the bench and they said, we don't read this kind of, we, we're not interested in reading about this crap. Let me hear what you have to say about it. So suddenly I was on the spot, you know. I see my time is running short. So I just want to quickly go to, um, uh, fast forward a little bit. Um, a long story short, I did get a, an initial funding round. Um, but my development took longer than I expected, three or four months into the process, I was already running out of money and I knew I needed about four additional or five additional months even to get going with the thing. This is always what happens with startups. You have to build in a long runway and typically your money is for a short runway. So, so what I had to do was a crowdfunding campaign and that's when things got really tricky. By crowdfunding, I mean I wanted to go to um, a crowdfunding platform. I forget now the name of the one I used. Um, uh, there are t- you know two main ones out there, um, and I decided I would make a video. My first thought on this video was that I would sit back in a large chair, wearing black tie, and have a very frank talk with the audience about what Liberty Dot Me uh, was and what it could do and why they should invest in it, and. Um, and then I realized that that just sounds like an incredibly boring idea. I mean, basically the idea of Liberty.me is it's supposed to be a fun place, a place of liberation, a place of happiness and joy, and a place that could make fighting tyranny um, an, an enjoyable um, and a happy occasion. And I realized sitting in a big leather chair with black tie on was not conveying that. So then I had to get really creative. And so one morning, it was a cold winter morning, I drove around, I I began to think this through. What is the most fun place in my hometown? What's the place where there's really fun things to do? And I remembered a little national uh, state park um, a couple of miles from my house that had playground equipment. So I drove up to it and I began to look around and I saw a slide, I saw swings, a pretty, pretty lake, uh, merry-go-rounds and things like that. I thought, what if I filmed my Indiegogo Indiegogo campaign here and talked about the funness of the site? And then I looked over at the lake and I saw there was a high dive going out into the lake and some boats too. And I thought, well, what if I rode in a boat also? And then I, then I thought, well, this, this, this whole Indiegogo campaign really needs some culminating moment, something that's really compelling and powerful. So I thought, what if I dived off the high dive, which is basically what starting a business is. It's, it's, it's diving off, you know, a high dive um, into the water, you know, wearing a, a suit and a bow tie as a way of illustrating just how serious I am about this. Well, there's, the big problem I faced was that this was um, January, and, uh, uh, and even in Alabama, January was very cold and the water was about 35 degrees. So it was pretty scary. But anyway, I brought my film crew out, um, allocated a little bit of my, my, um, my remaining capital I had in the business to hiring a really good film crew. And this is what I did. I rode in a boat. I slid down a slide. I talked about the fun and the happiness and the joy of the thing I was about to create. And then I made a very uh, personal pitch right at the end to join me in this great venture and jumped off the high dive backwards uh, in a suit uh, into 35 degree water. And uh, it was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. (laughs) But um, the net result was very exciting. This video went viral and I raised $250,000 from that, from that one video and this one Indiegogo campaign, which pushed me 
from January all the way through April and got me to the end of the funding campaign. I was able to open the website on May 1st in 2014. So a very exciting thing for me. Um, the reason I tell the story, I, I guess, is because, first of all, it's not often you hear, you know, beginning to end stories of entrepreneurship, really. But um, I think from a, point, from a messaging point of view, what I learned from that is that the most important thing that you can relay to your buyers, which, you know, in many ways, that's what we're all in the business of doing, is seeking customers for our product, whether it's a, a, an ideology, a point of view, a philosophy, or a business, we're all seeking customers, is to convey a culture of belongingness. And for whatever reason, I realized that I could not raise money unless I could make a video uh, a presentation of the culture that I was trying to create and invite people to join me and be part of that. To not stand apart, you know, as some sort of dictator or pontificator outside the business I was creating, but rather help the viewer embed himself or herself into the culture of what I was trying to create by taking this, what I thought was a very big risk of jumping backwards off a high dive into freezing cold water in a, in a three-piece suit. That was very scary to me. But it illustrated um, just, ha just the, the, uh, the, the level of risk and radicalism of the project I was creating. And for, what, for whatever reason, it was just an immense success. And one of the most successful uh, uh, funding campaigns around an ideological venture. I mean, in the end, Liberty.me is a little bit strange because I'm not actually selling a product as such. I'm selling a culture, an idea, an experience. I'm selling a sense of belongingness to a community. And I think that's what people lack today. Um, so many people who have high ideals, uh, political and economic ideals, are languishing and isolated and feeling alone but the digital world allows us, us uh, an opportunity for connecting with each other. And I wanted to sell that idea of connecting uh, with, with each other. And the result was, was spectacular, actually. I'm, I'm, it's one of my most proud moments in my life to have taken something that didn't exist, to imagine it, dream it up, conjure it up in my head, to see a future in which it did exist and to take all the necessary steps one by one to create it and see it, see it all the way through. And I can tell you, my friends, there's nothing more, uh, at least to me anyway, gratifying because um, it makes me feel like I've made a real difference through you know, entrepreneurship and creativity. For, for all the politicking and, and, and things that I've done in my whole life, um, there's something about having created this space that gives me a, a profound sense of accomplishment because I feel like I made a slight uh, difference in the world. And maybe, maybe we'll make a really big difference in the world. The site is only um, now 13 months old, and, or 12 months old, but it's doing extremely well. People say that startups need about three years to really take hold. Um, and I can tell you, that it's very easy to get exhausted. After six months, eight months, nine months, a year, you really do feel like, you know, throwing in the towel and getting back to normal life, you know? But you can't. You have to push through. Nothing great in this world has ever been accomplished without a massive amount of persistence, sacrifice, dedication, push, beyond the point at which you could you believe that you can be pushed realizing that i'm all in and i'm still pushing to this day so i've used more than my allocated time and i'm really glad to take questions and thanks for for listening to my small talk today well thank you as well jeffrey tucker we really appreciate you appearing today on icon 2 and i do have some questions for you first one is how do you reconcile the need for mass communication, such as email blasts, for example, 
with the need to personalize the message? How do you personalize a mass communication? Thank you. Well, that, that's a really excellent question, and thank you for asking. One of the things we need to realize, and it's a little bit startling, for about 10 years, people keep saying that email is going to be depreciated, that nobody cares about email anymore, all the young people are using SMS, instant Facebook messaging, blah, 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 there's other forms of communication. Uh, I'm here to tell you, don't believe a word of it. The single most valuable piece of digital real estate on the planet by far is email. That's always, that, that's just universally true today. And I can cite you just massive amounts of my personal experience in this regard. If you can put an email in somebody's inbox, <coughs> um, you have a, a real strong chance of, of selling them on a product. If you don't have access to that email and you're relying on people to just to, to show up, uh, uh, that's a very risky venture and it's not going to happen. It's not true in the World Wide Web that if you build it, they'll come. They will not come. You have to go get them and email is the only way to do it. But I think your, your question is very salient in a way. Um, you have to uh, speak as a human being. Uh, never think that the digital world offers, uh, operates as if by magic. Um, in the end, all communication is personal communication. Truth, honesty, sincerity, uh, being very open uh, about your views and your heart, uh, being uh, as overt as you can about your emotions and your feelings. Um, and you have one chance to get a hold, get people's attention, hold it and ask them to do something. Don't pass it up. Speak truthfully, honestly, persistently, and with, with, with all your heart. And I think you have the strongest uh, chance of success. Great. A uh, comment in our chat room uh, for you. Um, so it sounds like you allowed yourself to daydream about the content and character of your product long and hard enough to cover everything that you wanted to convey before you just jumped out prematurely. So for you, branding takes time and effort? <laughs> yeah, it, it did take me a long time. I wanted something to exist, but you're right. And at least initially, it was very broad, uh, and it wasn't specific enough. Uh, my investors, of course, they're putting their money on the line, were very concerned that I didn't have a marketable product and really encouraged me to uh, focus a long time on exactly what it is that we were, we were offering. So that, the, uh, that branding took a long time. You know, the other thing is I had, to <clears throat> I had to get over my shyness about it. Like I said, when I first started my Indiegogo campaign, this would have been in December, January, De December 2013, January 2014, I really imagined that I would sit in a chair, write a script that was very intellectually oriented. And I checked myself. I realized that's actually really boring, tremendously uninteresting, and it's not going to persuade anybody. Um, I mean, I think you and I are always under the impression that somehow the average consumer should be uh, impressed at your product idea. You know, here's my cupcake. Here's my new pair of running shoes. Here, you know, here's, here's a computer you should buy. That's really not true. What we have to sell are life experiences and transformative moments. Something that a person wants to put aside everything else in life they're thinking about and going, you know what? I want that. Uh, this is something that I choose to do more than anything else. You have to bump up that thing in their preference ranking from very low and not just to very high, not just to three, four, or, or two, you have to become the number one most important thing in a person's life at that moment. I and mean, whenever you're marketing anything, you have to do that. You have to be more important to that person than anything else in the whole world to cause people to act. That's very difficult. You can, you can, you can make a compelling case and still end up at two, three, or four, or five in their list of preference, preferences. It's not good enough they'll still walk away. You have to become number one. So yeah, that, that intensifies the burden on you as a salesperson or an entrepreneur as a marketer. You have to be the number one most important thing. 
And I believed in what I was doing, right? Very strongly. So I had to overcome my shyness and convey that belief and that idea in the most intense way possible, in the shortest space possible, to every single person who would, who would uh, take the time to listen to me. I'm very grateful that I, that I did it. But yes, it took, it took a lot of time and a lot of thought and a lot of heartache and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and quite frankly, a lot of courage because I was putting myself on the line. You can imagine from my point of view, it was like, I'm either going to be a genius at the end of this or a complete idiot, you know? And I don't know which is going to be. I could flop completely and have the whole world laugh or I could be just this epic guy, you know, who created this great space and everybody thinks is, is a monster genius. Uh, unfortunately, I'd, th I'd say after a year's experience, I'm not still sure <laughs> which of those two things I am. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It's, this, it's the fear uh, that you have to overcome. The fear of, of failure. It's the most important thing. Well, Jeffrey, thank you so much for being a part of ACON 2. We really appreciate you coming on. It was a great presentation, and we look forward to working with you in the future. And everybody, if you want to reach out, liberty.me, just like it sounds on. You can find it online everywhere. Jeffrey, thank you so much. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to tell my story. I really appreciate the invitation to be here, and it's a pleasure. Thank you so much.